Thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Ben Witte of Recess. Ben, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Great to be here. For sure. So I'd like to start out with your upbringing. So where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? So I grew up in uh, Laguna Beach, California, which is an hour south uh, of LA. Uh, it's basically a small kind of surf town, uh, beach town. Um, and growing up, I was kind of a, a surfer and a, a creative, I would say. I was really into photography and making movies and kind of digital art um, and uh, actually made the first kind of entrepreneurial and creative thing I ever did was make this basically a documentary uh, about this uh, um, sport that was invented in my town called skimboarding, uh, mm -hmm. which is where you throw this board uh, kind of on the sand and kind of ride out to the wave instead of sitting out in the ocean like surfing. And mm -hmm. the reason that sport was invented there is because uh, there's a lot of coves in Laguna, so the waves break really close to shore. Um, so anyways, made, you know, made a move with my friend when I was 16 and uh, kind of premiered it at the, you know, the local theater and sold copies in kind of local surf shops, you know, in, in the region um, and kind of thought I wanted to ultimately kind of be a filmmaker and um, ended up going to college uh, in Boston at Boston University because they had kind of a, a, a great film school and I thought I wanted to ultimately kind of enter that. Um, yeah. But uh, I can kind of you know, come back, come back to earlier. I'd say, look, um, I wasn't like the, I was never like the best student, to be honest, uh, in, yeah. in high school. I always felt like the system really wasn't designed for how I learned, uh, which is really by doing and kind of following my curiosity, for sure. Um, which I think I, you know, ultimately recognized and realized kind of in my, in my twenties. Um, but no, it was, uh, you know, a, a great place to grow up. Definitely. So I'm really fascinated with uh, the documentary that you created. So where did you learn some of those skills and the expertise behind filmmaking from the start? Uh, myself, right? It was really just like, you know, this was before, you know, I, you know, bought a, a camera and it was back when you still had tape, like tape. Uh, this was pre, yeah. you know, even a lot, a lot of digital photography. Um, I was, I got into like Super 8 film, which is one of those old school cameras. Oh, yeah. and, uh, my friend and I figured out how to like film on Super 8 and transfer it into kind of like a di into digital so you could edit it, um, you know, on a computer. You know, I started editing in iMovie and then we transitioned to kind of Final Cut Pro, but it was really just learning by doing. Um, mm. And um, yeah, I think we, it was still, that was like the early days of YouTube. So I still think there's like some things you could figure out, you know, yeah. online, but it was very much a learning by just doing uh, mentality. Awesome. So you went to, as you mentioned, Boston in 2006. Uh, with your time there studying film, were you involved with any clubs or athletics? Uh, I, first of all, I didn't end up studying film. I ended up transferring uh, into okay. the undergraduate business school because I felt that ultimately like film, I wasn't like fully convinced I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I felt yeah. if I would have studied that, it would have been too kind of narrowly focused, which I regret in retrospect, um, which I can kind of come back to. But I wasn't really involved in any clubs uh, or athletics, to be honest. It was, you know, it was just Boston University is kind of, you know, in a city. So it was very much kind of this city experience. Yeah. And it was very impactful for me because, you know, Laguna Beach is this kind of bubble surf town. And I was the first time, um, you know, all my friends ended up being from like New York City or from abroad. Yeah. Um, it was really just kind of soaking in, you know, living in a city. And then on the East Coast, I ended up spending a lot of time you know, New York and kind of just fell in love with New York City. Um, and so even, you know, college, I also don't, I was not the best, like, you know, student then either, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I also think it was because just, I wasn't really designed to learn through school, right? Or I didn't yeah. appreciate it at the time in a way that I do now, because I felt like it didn't, you know, the programs I'd learn were, were just not um, designed for what I was curious about. Got it. So as you mentioned, what was the leading factor into switching that degree and your aspirations from film to over the business department? I think it was more, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted, what I ultimately wanted to do. And I yeah. felt like by studying film, it would have been a little limiting. I think that was wrong in retrospect, but that was my thinking at the time. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, I come from a family, you know, people that are, you know, in the business world. Um, and, you know, it, my sister is a fellow uh, entrepreneur. And so that's kind of been in my blood, right? And so yeah. oh, I figured that since I wasn't convinced I wanted to be a filmmaker, that studying a little bit more, so, something a little bit more broad that was relevant across many things like business, quote unquote, whatever that means, yeah, uh, would be a, a better path, basically. For sure. And then uh, following school and prior to recess then with this degree, what kind of jobs were you working? Yeah. Um, so basically, so I, I'm 33. So I graduated in 2010, which mm -hmm. is right when the kind of the Silicon Valley startup scene was yeah. starting to take off. Um, and I had been starting to just track that, right? And was very attracted to basically what was happening in San Francisco. Um, and so I would decided I wanted to move to San Francisco and join a startup. Uh, I joined a three person startup uh, right out of school uh, that was built, actually building an influencer marketing platform for okay. social media. Um, and this was about like, we, they actually, we launched on like MySpace to give you a sense of where the world was. Wow. Um, and it was this very kind of impactful experience for me uh, because, you know, it was a tiny startup that I, I joined. Um, it was at the forefront of kind of social media marketing and really trying to think through how brands um, would uh, basically reach consumers, you know, in a social media yeah. driven world. And I think we predicted like the uh, idea of like influencer marketing, so to speak. Mm. Um, but it was one of these things that was like the right idea at the wrong time. I was like, I think it was too early. It was yeah. the wrong execution, wrong team, wrong investors, wrong everything, but uh, yeah. very impactful because from the earliest days, I got to think about what it would be like to build a brand in a social media driven world, which I then translated to recess. And then sure. I also think, you know, the best way to learn about like what starting a company is like is to join a very early stage startup um, and to just also learn, you know, and even I think it's even working for uh, what ended up being like a unsuccessful one at the, at the beginning was uh, impactful because I learned like what mistakes not to make. Basically. Definitely. Definitely. I, I completely agree with working for the startup, especially out of college. I, I am personally myself actually as, as well. And as you mentioned, Twitter was the launching point of this influencer platform. Were you guys actually finding influencers on Twitter or what did that structure kind of look like? Yeah, I mean, our thesis was more focused on like emerging musicians and artists um, because okay. on MySpace, it was very music oriented. And so MySpace, our that's right. thesis was like, um, you had all these emerging artists on MySpace who had, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of, of followers there. How could we create, and we had brands that wanted to kind of reach their audience. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of package up these campaigns Right. Um, yeah. And get, um, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it really started with musicians, right. And trying to, you know, leverage their influence. Um, and I think we started there because MySpace was really the first social network to get to scale. And then I got there. I'm like, clearly the world's going to Facebook. Yeah. Right. The founders were a little bit older. I um, mean, since I was in college, I could just see that, like, you know, my friends, no one was using MySpace. Everyone was transitioning to Facebook. And so, one of yeah. the first things I, uh, you know, did there was help, you know, transition the company to a focus on Facebook. Awesome. Cool. So moving on from that platform, uh, further on to your next jobs, what kind of jobs were you working prior to recess? Yep. So from there, um, I kind of recognized that, um, you know, you know, ultimately the current trajectory for the startup was not going to be successful. And, but I'd gotten exposed to kind of broad, like digital, ad, the digital advertising ecosystem. And mm -hmm. there's a startup I was tracking called AdRoll, um, who had kind of pioneered retargeting. So those ads that follow you around the internet for sites that you've been to before. Yeah. And I was like, this is obviously going to be a thing. Um, and uh, I ended up joining them when they were about 15 people. And I was there for f about four years. And when I left, we were like 500 plus people. Wow. And so that was a different type of experience. I saw, you know, what scaling uh, a company, you know, was like. Um, and I ended up, you know, starting in just like a very junior sales role and kind of working my way up. Um, 
into various kind of leadership positions. And, um, you know, I was kind of always the guy that was trying to figure out what was next for the company and kind of lead that initiative. So yeah. I was like the first person to focus on expanding us uh, overseas okay, uh, into international markets. And then I kind of saw the world transitioning into mobile. Uh, like when I joined, it was really a desktop advertising company. And mm -hmm. um, as kind of mobile became much, much more kind of uh, significant, definitely, um, I became the head of mobile. And so my job was to kind of operate cross-functionally to drive, you know, what our mobile strategy would be across product development, business development, uh, and sales. And so I guess you could say I was always kind of, you know, an entrepreneur, like within a company. Um, yeah. And, um, and, you know, ultimately I realized like, you know, I was just better suited to go start my own company than try yeah. and be disruptive within an existing company. Definitely. Um, but it was definitely um, a different type of experience because I just saw what, you know, building an organization was like and all the challenges and opportunities that that presents and, you know, how thoughtful you need to be about kind of organizational design and, and business For strategy sure. too. Right. I think I've always sure. loved just like strategy in general. Um, and it was kind of a fascinating um, kind of situation because we were kind of really built on top of Facebook and Google and you kind of had this like frenemy dynamic uh, with them and you, yeah, you know, the world was transforming um, again from desktop to mobile and the browser to apps and like how you think through like where we had an ability to play. And so I always enjoyed yeah. thinking about that stuff. For sure. So that's so fascinating seems like the trend in your career was B2B consumer technology. And then you shifted towards food and beverage, which mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated. What was the inspiration towards entering the CBD beverage space? Yeah. So like I said, like after about four years at AdRoll, I just kind of recognized that I was better suited to go at my own and start my own company. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was also smart enough to realize that I kind of, ended up in advertising technology by accident. It was not a deliberate choice. It was really about joining the first startup I could out of college, yeah. which kind of got me into this space and then getting exposed to the broader digital advertising ecosystem. But it was not like, it was my passion. It was yeah. just like where I ended up and I was able to really learn uh, about the industry and, you know, become like, you know, a pretty a leader within it uh, for a for period sure. of time. But, you know, I always... You know, I, I think, you know, I, I recognize that if I was going to start my own company, I would, I would want to focus on something that I was, you know, pa you know, myself kind of passionate about, right? Definitely. And that was kind of consumer experiences because I wanted to kind of leverage, you know, my design sensibilities. Um, yeah. Going back to like high school when I was a creative, I think at my core, those were kind of where my instincts led me. And yep. I remember getting this very important piece of advice um, when I was thinking through the next kind of phase of my career, which uh, from someone, and he said, kind of pay attention to what you pay attention to, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is like, what do you think about like when no one's watching basically, yeah. that's going to be, those are the things that you're going to be better suited to work really hard on. Right. Definitely. And for me, that was like various creative industries and, and design um, and things like that. And so the first idea, uh, startup idea I explored, um, was actually a hotel concept. Uh, this was when in like 2014, 15, um, when kind of WeWork and Airbnb were really blowing up. And the yeah. idea was like, Soho House meets a high-end hostel targeted at the WeWork crowd. And okay. I really believed in this idea of uh, actually like nomadic living, right? Which ended up mm. becoming, I think, more true because of, accelerated because of COVID. I was kind of Definitely. living in California uh, in New York. And I really believe in this idea of people would want like third spaces, like community spaces that they could gather with kind of like-minded people. Definitely. Um, and so this was like the hybrid between like a hotel and like a social club, right? What was the okay. concept? And ultimately like ended up bringing on a partner that were, that was like very senior at like the standard hotel group and, and, but just kind of ultimately recognize that like you're really in the real estate development business and that's a very, very capital intensive business. And like for my yeah. first startup idea, you know, I was probably not the best person to go raise like tens of millions of dollars <laughs> to go build, you know, hotels over a period of years. Yeah. 
Um, so ended up tabling that idea uh, okay. around 2016, uh, which was right when uh, it, it around 2016, and I ended up moving to New York to join two friends uh, in what was the idea was like to create a brand studio, like an incubator called Life yeah. Capital, where we were gonna explore a bunch of different consumer startup ideas. And the original insight for what became Recess came in 2016 when uh, during when Trump got elected. And okay. I remember thinking to myself, um, I don't know anything about the future other than it's going to be crazy, yeah. right? And to me, it really signified that we were entering this transformational period into history driven by technology. Um, and it was kind of, and essentially that like the world that we've created for ourselves, we as humans were like not designed to live in anymore. Totally. And again, it was kind of driving us all crazy. Um, and and I didn't view this as like a temporary thing. Like, I think this is like the foreseeable future is going to feel this way, right? For sure. Um, and so, you know, in that world, my bet was that basically consumers would increasingly prioritize our mental health and our mental well-being, hmm. right? And you had seen the rise of like apps, like Common Headspace, Yes. Seeing kind of the rise of like therapy being something that like no one talked about to something that like everyone talked about Definitely. within like a few years. And I saw an opportunity to create, you know, basically within consumer packaged goods products for that, that ultimately would make its way into the products that we consume, you know, in our body. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I started to see the rise of CBD oil and adaptogenic herbs and like supplements that really delivered a feeling of calm and relaxation. And I was like, Red Bull for relaxation. Like instead of an energy drink that includes caffeine and taurine, what if you made a drink that include, included CBD and adaptogens that delivered kind of the opposite effect? Yeah. I was, yeah, it was like Red Bull for relaxation. And I'd never... Ever, even looked at the CPG industry. I didn't even know, uh, know anybody that worked in it. Um, this was, you know, before it's gotten as kind of, I'd say, um, you know, there's been just a lot, it's transformed over the past few years where there's just so many new, you know, food and beverage startups today. For sure. And, you know, when I started to think about it uh, about, you know, four years ago, th there just wasn't that many. But I was able to like look at the industry, I think, with a fresh perspective where I was like, what is Red Bull? And I was like, yeah, to me, Red Bull was really a media company for the action sports community that monetized through selling cans. Definitely. Right. Now, like marketing a beverage is not just putting, uh, you know, liquid in the can and getting it on the shelf. It's really this whole holistic idea. For sure. Um, and again, you're really, you know, a large part of the business is brand marketing and that would leverage my kind of creative sensibilities. Definitely. And to be honest, I didn't have any better ideas, right? Like this yeah. was like the best idea uh, I had to go pursue. And so I decided this is it. And I was going to go, you know, focus hundred percent of my time on kind of building, building what became recess. That's amazing. So as you mentioned your branding background before, I I'm, a huge fan of the branding that you guys have currently. So does that branding that you have, does that correlate with the feeling uh, and the, with the actual ingredients of the can? Very soft pastels. Yeah, so I, it, I would know one thing, which is I never worked in any consumer marketing before recess. Like I, yeah. it was the first consumer marketing I ever did, right? Because my first two jobs were kind of business to business yeah. companies, right? Um, which is interesting, right? I, I knew, but I was, again, I was smart enough to realize, even though I'd never done it, I would be better. I would, just, I was well suited to do it. Definitely. Right. And I think that's really important for kind of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to recognize, um, which is like, what are you like truly intrinsically motivated and passionate about? Yeah. Because starting a company is so hard. Um, that I really am against kind of like entrepreneurship for sport, where it's just like any idea, like I'm just going to pursue any idea that I think is a good business opportunity, Yeah. right? It's like read some analysis online uh, because ultimately you're going to run into so many roadblocks that if you're not passionate about what you're doing, um, I think you'll just give up, right? Um, and so I, I do think that's like this important distinction. Um, and... 
Yeah. And then also asking yourself, like, what is the business you're actually in? Mm. Right. Like that. And I was able to like, I think, look at the food and beverage industry, like with fresh eyes. Right. And yeah. to your question about the, you know, the brand identity, one of my insights was the beverage industry in particular is really like the feelings business. It's really sure. about delivering a feeling like Coca-Cola is about happiness. Red Bull is about stimulation. If you look at how like different alcohol brands marketed themselves, it's all about kind of marketing and emotion, right? Yeah. Corona is about transporting you to sitting on the beach. Grey yeah. Goose is, was about positioning itself as a, a premium vodka through, you know, being the vodka served at nightclubs, right? Look at champagne or all, all these things. It's really Definitely. about marketing and emotion, yeah. right? Um, and um, so that, you know, that insight inspired much of what, you know, became the Recess brand. And I think my insight was that everyone was talking about CBD, for example. It was starting to get all this buzz. Yeah. But I'm like, CBD is not that interesting. What's interesting is what CBD represents. And yeah. what CBD represented is people's desire to feel calm, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I look at what essentially Recess is doing is introducing and leading the development of a new category focused on kind of calm and relaxation yeah. as opposed to stimulation from caffeine and intoxication from alcohol. And yeah. I really like kind of the jobs to be done framework, which is basically, you know, people hire brands to do a job, right? And yeah. they're a multi hundred billion dollar a year market uh, of products that help stimulate. There's a multi hundred billion dollar a year market of products that intoxicate. Definitely. And I think over, you know, the next, uh, you know, 10 years, or whatever, I think ultimately products that help consumers relax will also become uh, a market worth billions and billions of dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fundamentally about, in, you know, introducing this new feeling into the world. Yeah. Right. And um, again, if you look at how Red Bull marketed itself, it was, it's not marketing caffeine and taurine. It's marketing Red Bull gives you wings. Um, and it really, again, focused on the action sports community by sponsoring every athlete, sponsoring every event, and kind of creating the content around that event to create the association with having a Red Bull and getting stimulated. Mm. So yeah. the best marketing, I think, kind of says it without saying it, right? Yeah. If we would have just, if our marketing would have just be, you know, recess helps you feel calm or recess helps you relax, like over and over again, like no one would care. Yeah, but we really created this very, you know, unique brand world um, that I think was really impactful and effective at uh, you know driving the development of this category. Definitely, taking that branding and your B two B background from prior with influencer marketing. Uh, what are your main forms of marketing with Recess today? Yep. So we started out by just doing. So I'd say let's talk about the initial brand identity. So the idea, yeah. the story with Recess is really take a recess so you can feel calm, cool, collected. Mm. And the, the overarching idea is that we're an antidote to modern times. Yeah. Right. Um, modern times being that kind of stressful period in history that we're living through that I described earlier. Yep. The antidote being, you know, recess, the product that you consume to help you kind of cope with the crazy world around you. Calm, cool, collected is that feeling that we're trying to kind of deliver. And so I think we really nailed the, the story, right? It was a very yeah. easy idea for people to understand like how it would fit into their life. Mm. Um, and so I think that was really critical, right? Because yeah. again, just thinking of this as like a sparkling water with CBD in it is like insufficient, right? Like that would not yeah. have been enough. You really needed to package it all up um, in this very, uh, you know, compelling way. Mm. Um, so I think that was the first critical step was getting the initial brand identity right. The second sure. was like really building the brand world around the drink, right? Again, if you using the Red Bull example, right? You know, they uh, obviously have, there's a name on a can, right? But then there's the whole world they built around it, right? Yeah. Um, and so just like Red Bull focused on action sports and Gatorade focused on professional athletics, we focus on like creative culture. Mm. right? Um, music, fashion, art, design, internet meme culture, yeah. uh, et cetera. And I wanted to create kind of a visual identity that transported you, right? And so that's why if you look at like within our Instagram, which is really the first 
place we focus and kind of developing our own content, it's entirely illustrated, which is like yeah. groundbreaking, like at the time. Yeah. And then I had this premise of, look, in order to market, I had this a key insight of recess was that basically we were shifting from, for the food and beverage industry, we were shifting from a retail, entirely retail focused world to an mm. omnichannel world, Yeah. right? And increasingly brands would need to be able to reach consumers digitally, right? Yeah. Specifically within Instagram. And in order to connect with consumers digitally every day, you need to have something to say, right? You yeah. can't just post a different angle of the can every day, Definitely. right? And expect anybody to care, right? So I really believe in this idea of like narrative driven brands mm. that you would need to have like a story, right? In a way yeah. and have, be able to talk and have a conversation. And so the overarching idea of like, what is our brand and voice is, you know, recess is like a social commentary on the millennial or Gen Z existence. Yeah. We're really kind of speaking to these issues that we're all living through in a very kind of tongue in cheek way. Mm -hmm. um, and we did really unique things like personify each flavor. So each flavor represents a millennial archetype Mm -hmm. um like peach ginger's the party girl coconut limes like the hustler dude in miami blackberry chai's like the the emo like introspective one and That's they awesome. kind of talk amongst each other and that allows us to kind of create content you know every, every every day and so the first kind of thing we did was really focus on just literally one single instagram post a day for like you know three years right um and the idea yeah. the act of creating like a you know, a unique piece of content every day is actually pretty challenging. Yeah. Right. So that was like the first thing that really put us on the map. And again, it's, it's tough to like think about now, but like when we launched in kind of late 2018, that was groundbreaking. Like no one in CPG was really, fo really focused on digital uh, or even Instagram in, in a very meaningful way. For sure. The second thing we did, uh, I'd la I launched a company out of my apartment uh, in New York, uh, in the East Village. And the first retail market we focused on was New York. Mm. Um, and we did a pop-up um, called the Recess IRL, uh, which you can look up uh, online. And, I, and that, the idea there was to create a space in lower Manhattan that really felt like you were walking into the feeling we want you to feel when you drink a recess. Yeah. So really kind of the, the look and feel of the, the space looked like our Instagram. And yeah. we ended up hosting you know, three to four events a week there um wow. with different brand and creative partners you know for six months straight Jeez. and so that was this very impactful you know thing we did and so you know you asked like what the marketing strategy was it was really to create our own content and experiences do mm -hmm. no paid marketing no yeah. influencer marketing either okay like we're just starting influencer marketing wow. and my thinking there is you want to be cool yourself before you ask people to make you, you cool. Yeah, definitely. I, I think people start with influencer marketing way too early. Um, it's, I think it's, it's good. It's important to have some established brand awareness for sure uh, and have kind of, and then accelerate and amplify that through various means, influencer marketing, paid media, uh, et cetera, yeah. versus just trying to do paid right away. Definitely. We really spent like two years establishing you know, this brand foundation and now we're in this position to like accelerate it. Hmm. And so I'd say that's a couple thoughts on, on how I think about the marketing. Wow. That's very unique. And I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your marketing strategy on socials as well. Um, with that marketing strategy, what would you say is the main demographic? You mentioned very young demographic on the go, hard workers. What would you say? Yeah, I, I'd say it's, um, it's kind of, you know, 22 to 34, you know, kind of your classic millennial going down to Gen Z, mm -hmm. um, probably young professional. We skew a little female, probably like 60, 40 female, male. Okay. Um, pretty, you know, in all the major, you know, markets and cities, but now we're expanding, you know, nationwide. Um, and so, you know, surprisingly diverse from a geographic standpoint. Yeah. But I'd say it's, you know, it's what you would, ex to a degree, it's what you would expect. We, we get a lot of like, um, and people drink recess for a lot of different reasons. I think that's an interesting mm. uh, point to talk about, which is, 
you know, when I started the brand, the original brand positioning was it's how you wish the two o'clock coffee made you feel is really about mm. replacing that afternoon coffee, which I looked at as really like a recess actually. Yeah. Um, with something that made you feel calm and help you get in the zone and fe- instead of helping you get overly stimulated, like what that afternoon coffee can be about. For sure. Um, but what we like soon recognized was that people were drinking recess all at various times throughout the day for a variety of reasons, uh, including probably the core use case is in the evening as a substitute for alcohol now. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we have just a lot of different people drink recess for different reasons. And so I'd say a lot, a, a core kind of usage occasion is as an alcohol substitute. So we'll see like a lot of moms that will, you know, want to drink a recess, you know, on a weeknight instead of a glass of wine. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes like the occasion can drive like the consumer in terms of who it's, re- who, who it is relevant for. And I think this is worth noting. Like I got all of my insights uh, for recess uh, from Instagram, you know, in the early days. Yeah. Um, and just kind of just really paying attention to how people were using the product and, you know, when they were drinking it, what they were looking to feel. Yeah. Um, and that really ins- like inspired a lot of the, the strategy for what uh, ended up, you know, we ended up doing basically. For sure. So looking at recess today, what would you say separates recess from competitors? If, if there's direct competitors out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, now we operate in multiple categories. So we have our CBD beverage line. We have this line called Recess Mood, uh, which is a uh, magnesium-based line, which is focused on kind of calming the mind and lifting the mood. And that's in both beverages and supplement form. Okay. Um, And so I think a couple things, you know, one is our view on the category. Um, I've always rejected the premise uh, that like Recess is a CBD company. Yeah. And uh, my line on that was, uh, was always like, I've never heard anyone call Red Bull a caffeine company. That's true. Right? Yeah. About the feeling that the brand delivers and enables. And in our case, there's multiple types of ingredients that we can use to deliver kind of nuanced feelings, uh, as well as the fact that this category um, exists in supplements as well. Yeah. So a key part of our strategy is to be to go broad early and play in multiple subcategories over time. Um, Got it. And so I think we have no direct competitors and many indirect competitors yeah. in different categories that we are playing in. Um, that was one. The second was, I think, our strategy of building a brand for an omnichannel world, right? Mm-hmm. Basically betting that digital from both a distribution perspective and a brand building perspective would be uh, increasingly important. And now yeah. that's obvious in like a post COVID world. Yeah. But again, when we launched in late 2018, no one had really launched direct to consumer, right? Sure. No one was really, no beverage brands were really focused uh, on Instagram and, you know, connecting with consumers digitally to the extent they are today. Definitely. Uh, um, and so that was this key bet that ended up really positioning us well for when COVID arrived, which was like a big kind of accelerant for our business. Okay. Because we were already kind of prepared for it. Yeah. Um, the third I'd say is like the brand, you know, the brand, our brand strategy overall is really critical. Like you, you are in the brand marketing business. You know, yeah. once you have a product that uh, an initial set of, you know, people connect with, you have product market fit, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, the beverage business is about scaling nationally, right? You do not you either want to be really big or really small in the beverage business. And our, um, aspirations have always been to be really big, yeah. right? And we had to kind of create a brand foundation um, that was scalable. And I think Recess is this brand that you can just kind of imagine a future where it exists on a much larger scale than it does today. And I don't sure. think that's true about, you know, some brands. Um, and I think that's an important element. You want it to feel almost inevitable and timeless. Like I, I think it's like an important uh, element. Um, I think we have a first mover advantage where, you know, we were really the first, uh, we're the category defining brand here. Like we're the clear number one leading uh, CBD beverage brand. We're the, I'd say the now leading the non CBD part of the beverage category. Supplements is a more established, stress relieving supplements is more established, uh, but we'll enter that to kind of compete with some established brands there. Mm. Um, And in a category creation dynamic in any industry, but especially 
CPG, uh, there's a huge first mover advantage because you become the default first choice in the consumer's mind and mm. the retailer's mind and distributor's mind. And it's kind of just kind of compounds on itself. For sure. Um, and so, you know, we have that advantage. And then, look, I've just been aggressive. Like we're playing to win and I've been playing to win from day one, right? I like yeah. when I, I said like Red Bull free laxation, I wasn't like joking, right? Like I think someone is going to build over like the next 10 years longer, maybe something on the order of Red Bull here. Yeah. Um, because I think the proposition is universal and the beverage industry is pretty capital intensive um, because it requires just a lot of people, right? These beverages don't get on the shelves themselves. Like we have you know, salespeople in every market requires a lot of marketing. You have to hold, have a whole direct to consumer and Amazon team, right? It's just a fairly capital intensive business. Um, and so, you know, we financed ourselves in a way um, mm. that allows us to do that, um, which, you know, has pros and cons with it, right? Like, for sure. Um, you know, when you raise money, it comes with a certain level uh, of expectations. Um, but I think it's been the kind of the right approach for us. And so I think it's like a bunch of different factors combined. Definitely. Um, but it, it's, it's challenging, right? It is really challenging to, 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 build, to build a category. Mm -hmm. um, I, and they, they just take time to, to, de to develop. So I think it's really important to have this like long-term orientation uh, to your business. 100%. Well, Ben, I like to conclude each episode with this. If you could share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, uh, maybe something you've learned or regret, what would that be? Um, I mean, I'll go with a couple. I'd say to reiterate the point I made earlier, um, I'd say be patient with the, uh, the idea you go all in on, right? I think you can have kind of side projects that are like experiments. Yeah. Um, but I think ultimately you want to go all in on a single idea because mm just scaling any business is just so challenging yeah. um, that it requires like all of your thought and effort to, to, to go into it. And so make sure the idea that you end up, you know, pursuing with hundred percent of your focus is something that you're truly passionate about mm -hmm. and uniquely suited to uh, execute on. Right. I do think that recess, even though I didn't know anything about the food and beverage industry when I entered, right? That there's a number of factors within this industry that actually play to kind of my intrinsic uh, advantages. Mm -hmm. um, so that was point one. And then point two is surround yourself with people um, that have done it before, whether that's investors, advisors, and your team. I ended up hiring like a very senior executive team because I recognize what my strengths are and I know what yeah. I also don't know. And I think it's really important to kind of compensate uh, for that. Um, so I think those are the two, 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 two critical uh, pieces of advice I would give. For sure. Well, Ben, thank you so much for joining me. And to the listeners out there, make sure to check out Recess at takearecess.com.